Well, certainly today's passage is one that almost everybody is familiar with, as many of the sayings in the book of Ecclesiastes are popular sayings in the culture. For everything, there is a season. But God gives us these things to teach us lessons. And the main lesson uh, that the preacher from the book of Ecclesiastes is trying to get across is these seasons teach us about God, about the fact that there is a creator and we are part of his creation. And so I want to take a few moments today and look at three lessons that we can learn that will help us respond to the seasons of life. Now we all go through seasons, don't we? He says in, the, the, in chapter 3, verse 1, there are seasons. Well, do you have seasons? Yeah. What season are we in now? Let's see. We're about to enter summer, I think. I've gotten a little confused about seasons this year. But uh, we're all in seasons. And you're in season of living. Uh, I'm in the season of winter. I know that sounds really sad, but when you are, I'll be 70 in a couple months, you are in winter. I'm sorry to wake some of you up that are here in their 70s and beyond, but uh, most of you will not live to be 100. Uh, and so you're in the winter of life. You're entering into that stage. If you're young, you think that, that uh, uh, spring will last forever or summer will last forever. But you will find that you'll go into these different seasons. What should we do? Well, as we study this passage, the writer is trying to get some points across to us. And here's the first point I think he wants us to understand. We need to get real. Here's the reality. For everything in, Galatia, in Ecclesiastes 3.1, here's the reality. Everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under a heaven. Life is a mixed bag. For every positive that he mentions in this passage, which we love to quote and hear, but when we really realize that for every positive, there is a negative that he gives. 14 positives and 14 negatives. Here it is. A time to be born. That's terrific. We love it when a baby's born and you hear the cry. And, but then there's a time to die. That's not quite as positive sounding. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. And the preacher is pointing out that life is not simply random chance, but there is order and there is design in life. And you can observe that order and see that design. And we know that even though there's order and design, something is broken. Because there is a time to be born, but there's also a time to die. And something is broken, and we yell out about that. There's something not quite right. Ecclesiastes 3.3, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Yet even in the life that we live where sometimes things are going very good and sometimes it's not quite right, we sense there is organization, there is planning, there is structure, there is the seasons of the years, there are the times of our lives, and we sense behind the scenes something is operating. But he goes on to say also there's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Why can't it all be good? Why can't we just dance and laugh? Why do we have to have the death and the weep and the mourning? Why has that got to be thrown in the mix? And the preacher's going to remind us that we who want it so good are not so good. There's a problem in this world that we live in. And he wants us to understand the problem. Ecclesiastes 3.16 tells us, Moreover, I saw 
under the sun that in place of justice even there was wickedness and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness and what he's pointing out is that we live in a very fallen world a very broken world later he'll say in Exodus 7:20 surely there is not a righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins now there are people who are nicer than other people perhaps but there is no such thing as a sinless person we are a fallen race in a fallen world and part of that fallen world means that we experience things that are negative as well as things that are positive Romans 3:10 says there is none righteous no not one now we have a much clearer insight as to what is happening since we're on this side of the cross we have much more scripture than the preacher had and we have more knowledge and more opportunity to understand what is taking place Romans 8 18 tells us I consider that the sufferings of this present time which we all will go through are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us notice in verse 19 for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope now here's what I think is happening here what if you were born in this world and everything was perfect all the time you never had a fight never had an argument you always got the right position in life you always had enough money you always had enough food you sang you danced it was wonderful except for one thing you would not know that you were a sinner and the wages of sin are death you would not know that there is an eternity to be gained in a positive sense or eternity to be lost in a negative sense it is the hardships that come our way and the difficulties that come our way that remind us that we are sinners in need of grace and salvation so he creates that God gives this earth or puts it in futility so that we might cry out to God and discover who he is Romans 8.21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So it's subjected in hope, and the hope is that we seek out God and we find God. And if we find God, one day we'll live in a world that will not have any of these things. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth unto now and not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly and I like to tell you that the older you get the more you groan we groan inwardly we know something is happening uh, we, we feel it we, we sense that we are we are in the part of life where we begin to break down and decay you say where did that ache come from time and we realize these things and so we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies but the preacher was not clueless about this when he is pushing us in the direction of seeking God he is aware that there's a time for this and a time for this because we're in a fallen world and so there is positive and there is negative he was aware of what took place in Genesis Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 God saw everything that he made and behold notice this it was very good we cannot say everything on the earth today is very good but when God created the earth and God put Adam Eve on the earth it was very good that was the situation and then sin enters the world and in Genesis 3.16 God sentences man on his situation in earth because of the sin brought into this world he says to the woman I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing in pain you shall bring forth children 
Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So we have a mess up of the family relationship, and we have pain and childbearing as a result of sin entering the world. Verse 17, to Adam he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Have you ever heard somebody say, why is life so hard? Here's why. Because man sinned. And fallenness came into this world. And the ground is cursed. Verse 18, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Thus, there were good times, and there were bad times, and that's what will take place all the course of our life. We can expect good, and we can expect bad. Until, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in Him, we are going to a place where all those effects of fallenness will be taken away, and you will be in the presence of the living God. And listen to how that's going to be. In Revelation 21.4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. There are two things that will not be needed in heaven, doctors and undertakers. They're out of business. We will have new bodies, and we will not suffer the decays of sin. It will be wonderful. But now, we live in the real world on earth, and we live in the consequences of a fallen world. Ecclesiastes 3.8, there's a time to love and a time to hate. A time to, for war and a time for peace. Now, he's not necessarily speaking about the individual here. That is, there is a time to love and a time to hate, he says. It may not be you personally. You may say, I don't hate anybody. But is this a world filled with hate? Is this a world where wars break out all over and people are killed? If you, and you know, because we have television and internet and all this, we see it some more readily. This is a very difficult world. And in your life, you will experience good, positive, and you'll experience negative things. So the preacher asks the question. He says this, what gain has the worker from his toil? Why, what, what sense is it? What is the purpose of all this? But it is a question he answers. Listen to verse 10. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Here's what happens. You begin living this life, and it's hard. It's difficult. You go through struggles. You don't understand why this happened and what took place here. And then at the same time, there's weddings and joy and dancing, and it's a mixed bag of things. But you begin asking questions. Why am I here? What is it that makes this earth work or do this? What do I need to know? And then you begin to figure something out. This life goes in cycles. There is spring, summer, winter, fall. There's order. There's direction. And even though at times it seems like there's chaos, but if I really stop and think about it, something is overruling everything. And that's exactly what the preacher is trying to get across to us. If you think about life, and you think about the circumstances of life, you're going to come to a conclusion that something or someone is in control outside of the sphere of who we are and just this earth. And that's when you begin to reflect upon God. When you begin to think about God. And you begin to think about the fact that in this fallen, broken world, 
we receive mercy and grace at the hand of God. There may be seasons, but God reveals himself to us through those seasons. And even in the midst of hardship, he's to be found. That's what the preacher is concluding here. In Ecclesiastes 3.12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also, that every one should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift. Despite, despite a spin, sinful nature, despite a broken world, God gives us a measure of joy and of peace. He causes the rain to fall on the good and the evil. He brings blessing in our life, even though we're in a fallen world. And it causes us to reflect upon him and who he is. And life on earth is exactly what God said it would be. And it ought to bring reverence of us to God. Ecclesiastes 3.14, I perceive that whatever God does doors forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has done it. Now notice why. So that people fear before him. God is getting our attention. And the most important thing in the mind of God is to bring us from a lostness, separated from God, alienated from him, to a relationship and he does it through the seasons and the change of the seasons and the events of our life that cause us to say, why am I not always here? And then we realize our sinfulness and we realize God's hand in the whole matter and we cry out to the living God. So after we get real, the next thing God wants us to get, we understand how this system is working now. God wants us to get religion. Now, not in a classical sense where you get some kind of formality and worship something you don't know. That's not what I'm talking about. But a reverence for the fact that there is a creator and we are the created. So we examine life and we say something like this. There must be more. There must be more than just getting up, going to work, raising my family, seeing my kids grow, being happy for a while and dying. There must be more. And that's what God is doing. He's driving us to that point of that. After all, if there isn't more, if there isn't a sense of right and wrong and direction and control, then, then we're just mere animals. You know, a lion gets hungry, it just attacks something and eats it. It has no sense of murder or wrong or right. A snake bites you, it's poisonous, it doesn't care if you die. But we have something else going on in our lives, and we sense that within us there is this sense and this idea that there is, a, there is something working in us that is greater than us. And that's when we begin to seek God. So we say something's wrong. Something's wrong. But let me say this. The very fact that you say something is wrong is an indication of the existence of God. Where did you get the idea of right and wrong? You think a, a snake bites somebody and says, oh, <clears throat> that was a mistake. I did wrong. You think a, a, a lion or a tiger attacks an animal and, or, and says, oh, I did wrong. But we know intuitively that there are things that are right and things that are wrong. And I believe in watching God's creation and seeing how God works in the world and having that intuitive sense of right and wrong is God drawing us out to him that we might discover who he is. Religion is the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power. Religion is when you and I discover that we are not it. We are not the center of the universe. We are not all that there is. And our lives don't just start here and end here. But there's an eternal aspect to it. And the preacher wants us to seek it out and find it. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3.15. That which is already has been, and that which will be already has been. God is that God and seeks what has been driven away. So we, have the, we can count on, on, on the fact that we're going to have spring, summer, winter, fall. We can count on certain things because God is a God of order and structure. And we can see that this whole earth is ordered and structured. 
So all the cycles of history repeat themselves, and we get a hint about God. Ecclesiastes 3.16, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, with such a fallen creatures, and the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, in analyzing this whole thing, I said in my heart, God, ah, oh, there's a judge somewhere. God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. So if there is control in this universe, someone sets the seasons in place, there is a controller, and that controller is God. And we are not just random chance. We are created creatures who have an accountability to the Creator. And this is, I think, where the author of Ecclesiastes is bringing us. In verse 18, I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they, are themsel they themselves are but beasts. Now, he's not talking about, as we would use the word today, in an evolutionist thing, like we evolved, uh, an animal evolved. No, no. He's saying when we die, we end up just like everything else. Our bodies decay and we rot. And he's saying we are not godlike. We are created. We have serious limitations. Ecclesiastes 3.19, for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beast. All is vanity. In other words, we die and we rot. And then he wants us to think about that. And then he wants us to think, what about beyond? He says, all go to one place. All are from dust and to dust they return. Again, this is not a comment about eternity. This is a comment about humanity. We are created beings. We don't sustain our own lives. We have no way of doing it. You can, you can go to a hospital and they can hook you up to all kinds of machines, but eventually you're going. We all are. And we, there's nothing we can do about it. We understand that. And so we think beyond the current time that we live in. And God has planted eternity in our hearts. None of us want to say, I just want to disappear. God has planted that in us. There must be something more. And then we see his order and his structure, and all of a sudden we begin to see God is a God of plan and design. And so we can figure out that God exists. We can figure out that God is a God of order. We can figure out that God is a God of justice. He's the creator, and he holds us to an accountable standard. And we can figure out that we dare not neglect him. Ecclesiastes 3.22, For I saw that there is nothing better than a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? We dare not neglect God, and we live out our lives in the acknowledgement that while we are living out our lives, we are watched and seen by the eternal Creator. Now, he also talks about the, the, the sort of hopelessness that occurs in us. For instance, let's say you made a million dollars this year, and uh, you're now late in, in age, and you're getting ready to die. And you say, I'm going to give that million dollars to my son or my daughter. Now, what could your son and daughter do with it? Well, they might be wise, as he says in some passages in Ecclesiastes, or they might be really stupid. They might say, you know, I'm going to Atlantic City and see what I can do with this a million dollars. What do you think they'll do with it? And you've labored all your life. You have planned all your life to help your children. And what do they do? They blow it. And you can't even control that. And you realize there are such limitations upon us. And that's when you begin to really seek God. Now, do we know what's going to happen to people when they leave? Yes, we do, because God has not left us clueless. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed to man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. God is a God of order, a God of structure, a God who sets righteousness in place, a God of judgment. When, when man has sinned, this earth became fallen. But we can catch all that about God's nature, and there will be a day when everybody will stand before God even the believer, 
and give an account of their life. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it says, Each one of us will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. And what the preacher is trying to do is to get our attention off of that which is temporal and stop complaining about our current situation, but look beyond life on earth into an eternal aspect and to see and discover the living God. Well, we can get real, we can get religion, and then I think he wants us to get relationships. Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that doing the Christian life, living the Christian life, was never meant to be alone. First we get in relationship with God, then we get in relationship with God's people. Listen to what the preacher does. He gives us a few insights about how we should live our lives in this fallen and broken world. Here's the first one he gives us. Don't spend your life and all your energies trying to keep up with the Joneses because it's all going to the junkyard. It's all going there. You know, they have this commercial guy pulls up in his house in a new car and his neighbor's looking and whew, he's tempted. Listen, it, if God blesses you, that's fine. But the reality is striving after things and more things is mostly just a waste of effort. If he, Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, listen to what he says. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. We are told in scripture and taught to learn to be content. We're in this broken, fallen world. We have purpose when we discover God and we learn to be content. And if you focus on what other people have, and you folk, how come they're so lucky? How come they're so happy? How come they're this? If you focus on all those things, you know what you are? You're never happy. But if you focus on God has given me the rain, he's given me enough food, he's given me clothing and shelter, therewith I shall be happy. You will find life to be much more pleasant. Second, don't go to the other extreme. And the other extreme is don't sit back and do nothing. Say, well, you know, there's a time for this and there's time for this, therefore I can do nothing. No. And so he says Ecclesiastes 4, 5, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after the wind. The other, the other opposite that happens is we become hopeless and we begin to say, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, God has responsibility for us. He is a God who is a creator, a God who organizes and plans. He expects us to be a people who are creative, organized, and planned but he doesn't expect us to go crazy trying to get all we can down here, and he doesn't expect us to go lazy and do nothing. He expects us to live our life under the acknowledgement of his sovereignty and who he is, and honor him with what we do. And so don't go the other extreme, but here's what will help you walk the Christian walk, and this is what the preacher wraps up with in chapter 4. He says, in verse 4, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. I can tell you, having been married 47 years, that two, almost 47, two are better than one. I can tell you that, that it's a great thing. But not everybody's married. And so, what do they do? Well, you have to find relationships in the Lord that are helpful and that, that will help you live your life in a way that honors Him. Look what he says in the next verse. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he fails and has no one to lift him up. Here's one of the great mistakes we make about life. We attempt to live the Christian life a bit of like an island. We don't get involved in small groups. We don't get involved in relationships. We don't get involved in hanging out with people at the church. And what happens when, when crises comes, when tragedy comes, when heartache comes, we don't know how to withstand it because God has designed life to be a partnership, believer with believers, helping one another. 
And so when you say life doesn't make sense, God has a believer to come alongside of you and say, yes, let me help you through this. It makes sense because God has done this and God has done this. And so God wants us to be together. Look what he says in verse 11. Again, if two, he says, again, if two are, are together, he, lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Now, of course, if you have a wife with cold feet, you may have some difficulty. However, this is not what that's talking about. In the old days, they didn't have heaters. They had a fireplace. And when they slept, they slept in a general room and they all wrapped up together because they shared the body heat. Incidentally, they loved to sleep in the barn too. You know why? Animals are natural heaters. And that's how they kept, they realized they needed each other. And that's what kept them on course. And if you want to be able to, to navigate the course of this life and understand some of the things that God is doing, we need each other. He says, and then verse 12, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And then we read in Scripture elsewhere, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and of course that would be the indication of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we supposed to be doing? We're in this broken world, and we realize it. We realize we're human. Then we discover that God, there's a God, and we discover we're sinful, but we need salvation and forgiveness and relationship. And then we fall into that relationship with God. But now I'm still in this broken world. What do I do? He says in Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, not wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There is a season, a purpose, a time for everything in life. And when we discover that God is the one behind it all, and we discover who he is, we discover our fallenness, our brokenness, our need of a Savior, and we come to a Savior. But don't think we do it alone. Then we need to get tight with people who know God and walk this life hand in hand, relationship to relationship, until the day comes where either you will go to be with the Lord or the Lord will call us all up on that great day of rapture. There is surely a God in heaven, and the seasons of life reveal him. And if there is a God, he's worthy of worship and obedience. And life with like-minded people helps us walk in this broken world in a way that honors God and is a blessing to us. That's when you stop chasing the wind and running after everybody's suggestion and everybody's idea, and you really begin to get your life together. Otherwise, it is what the preacher says, meaningless, meaningless. Why am I here, and what am I doing? Well, let me say, just say this. We say, where did the time go? And the answer is, time does not go, we go. That's what we need to prepare for. Time does not go. We go. There will come a time where you will not be here anymore. And that's the thing that we need to be ready for. And all the circumstances of life are given to us to drive us to our knees to discover a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, let me ask you this question. Are you ready to go? And I don't mean leave the service. I mean, are you ready to go? And if you are, then you can live life to the fullest. But if you're not, you'll continually be hitting your head against the wall saying, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. I trust you are. Let's pray together. Father, help us to be ready to go and meet the living Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.